Welcome, everyone. My name is Jack Fortin, and I'm the curator and facilitator for this virtual Winter Centered Life series. Uh, I want to begin by reminding you of a few of the logistic details to make this uh, a, a good experience for our participants. First of all, today's meeting will be recorded as it will be posted to the Augsburg YouTube channel and it'll be done at a later date. Secondly, we do have live captioner today. Please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen uh, to enable that transcript. And lastly, we will have time after we hear from our speakers for a Q&A, so please enter any questions you might have in the, on the chat space, and we will attend to those as best we can during the course of the presentation. So now I would like to introduce you to our theme and remind you of our theme of this series and introduce to you our speakers for today. The Winter Centered Life Series overall theme is our historical heritage, interrogating our sagas as we seek to live faithfully in the time being. And let me remind you that the impetus for this came as we reflected on the current situation, uh, given our prolonged crisis pandemic and how individuals and communities, as well as institutions, are tending to look for short-term relevant fixes instead of looking at our roots for guidance. We are making it up as we go for many of us and our future is based more on the immediacy of the crisis. In the face of this tendency, we decided to unveil the findings of this multi-year research project uh, that has been addressing Augsburg's historical heritage. And we're doing it as a demonstration of how anchoring ourselves in our own personal and institutional heritages, we can rekindle core understandings and discover pathways for our own sustainable future. We all have a heritage to draw on if we choose, a family heritage and a faith heritage. We can gain inspiration and motivation to address our moorings as we delve into the heritage of Augsburg. This institution has been demonstrated over the last many years a renewed vitality. So we're again fortunate to have two members of the Augsburg community to present today. They have uh, been uh, tangentially a part of this team and have been mining uh, the heritage in their own way through their own work. So I would like to first introduce you to um, Muna Abdurakman, Abdurak, who is a nurse who is studying at Augsburg University in the doctoral program to become a family nurse practitioner. She is passionate about civic engagement and strives to achieve health equity. Muna is currently working on her dissertation at Augsburg University, which focuses on advancing maternal health, specifically within the black patient population. And most recently, she has been appointed by the Minnesota Department of Health to serve on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee. And by trade and interest, Muna is a community organizer, primarily invested in South Minneapolis with an organization that she holds deeply in her heart. It's called Hope Community. She served on their board of directors for 10 years and is led as the co-chair of the organization. So welcome, Muna, to our time today. I would also like to introduce to you Dr. Katie Clark, uh, a professor here at Augsburg University. Dr. Clark began teaching at Augsburg University in the Department of Nursing in 2009. She teaches primarily in the graduate nursing program and courses that focus on issues of social justice, health disparities, and civic engagement. Katie's scholarship emphasis is creating unique models of teaching and learning in local contexts. She serves as the executive director of the Augsburg Health Commons, which are nursing-led drop-in centers that focus on radical hospitality and nurse presence working with people in local context. Wow, two fantastic presenters we have today. 
The title for this particular presentation is Accompanying Our Neighbors. We believe we are called. This final session will draw the various threads of the previous sessions together to describe Augsburg's distinctive commitments to being neighbor. In particular, the Augsburg Health Commons at Central Lutheran Church and in Cedar Riverside will be used as case studies of how Augsburg pursues faith in action. So welcome again, Muna and Katie. And I'd just like to begin by asking you, given both of your very diverse backgrounds and your commitments, not only to Augsburg, to the larger community, what's drawn you to Augsburg? Maybe we'll start with Katie. Yeah, um, I came here as a student. So I came here about 13 years ago. I was practicing inpatient and um, loved that world, but was spending a lot of time going to other countries and volunteering um, when I had some vacation hours and really felt like something was missing in that medical mission model. And I heard about this program and uh, at the Transcultural Nursing Program at Augsburg and really um, felt called to come here. And so I came here as a student and I haven't left, so. Well, thank you, Katie and Muna. So as an undergrad, I always went to surrounding schools, the U of M, St. Kate's close by, um, but I had uh, friends who were going to Augsburg and heard nothing but great things. Also, um, Augsburg's um, approach in de-emphasizing the expert model um, and viewing community um, in a way that, you know, through the harm reduction uh, methods, as well as just um, the strategies of, you know, this radical approach that Augsburg takes and uh, walking with community and centering community is really what drew me to um, apply for the grad program and eventually choose it, so. Well, thank you, Moon. So we're looking forward to your presentation, and so let's get on with it. So, um, Katie, are you beginning or Muna? Which? Muna's gonna start us off. Okay. Let us begin, thank you. So our uh, presentation is um, uh, accompanying our neighbors. We believe we are called. Um, my name is Muna Abdurrahman. I am a fourth year grad student in the FN Family Nurse Practitioner Doctoral um, Program. I am also on the SAGA project uh, um, with the president. I um, am doing my uh, thesis, my scholarly project on advancing maternal health. Um, specifically in the black population. Um, and one of my focuses um, has always been, and my passion has always been health equity. Um, so that's brought me to with the health commons and specifically the Cedar Riverside community, um, which is really um, important in the work that we're doing here in the health commons. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, can you go back to that other slide? The floral one, thank you. Um, so one of the uh, strategies, um, quotes that really drew me in was don't ask who is my neighbor, rather who am I to my neighbor? Um, and I think that's a really um, important question to ask ourselves, how we come across as an institution to our surrounding um, neighbors in our community. Um, in terms of our outline and our agenda today is really describing Augsburg's health commons, its history, especially um, as it relates Augsburg's distinct commitment to, um, to be of place. Um, we will also highlight those leadership and uh, those leaderships and mentors that came before us while drawing on um, some of the co comments and threads from the previous conversations. Um, in the in the series at 
And then uh, second, we're gonna share our vision and our model of accompaniment um, at the Augsburg Central Health Commons and the Health Commons Institute of Riverside um, as means of providing um, case studies or examples of mission-driven work. Um, thirdly, we're gonna discuss how this represents our call to neighbors. Um, so our vocation as examples of how Augsburg pursues faith in action. Thank you. Um, so in, um, here in this slide, we have a picture of a sign that says, um, it, it's in Somali, um, and then it says Health Commons drop in center. The hours are Wednesdays and Fridays, 1 to 5 p.m. Um, and the Augsburg Health Commons is a collaborative effort between Fairview, the Augsburg uh, University Department of Nursing, and the East African Health Project. All right, next slide. All right, um, so I'm just gonna share a little bit of the timeline and the history of the Health Commons before kind of diving in more into the model. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give a visual of its existence since we're talking about interrogating our history. And so, as you can see, the first Health Commons at Central Lutheran Church opened in 1992. Um, from that, we were able to connect with others in the neighborhood and think about opening a second Health Commons, which is in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. Um, in 2012, there was another site opened um, at uh, the living room and at Redeemer Center for Life. And really we've kind of, it's based on the same model, but we haven't been as involved, but our partner M Health Fairview has been. And then in 2019, we opened a location in Rochester, which currently is closed due to COVID. And then right now we've just cont continually been expanding some of the work of um, what we've been already having in progress. So uh, if you wanna just tap the button one more time, TJ. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on 1992. And obviously this is when we officially opened, but I just kinda of wanna open up to all of you. What do you think that was happening in the late or early 1980s that led to the nursing department wanting to think about opening a health commons? What was happening in the world? Does anybody have any ideas? I know you do. Yeah, let's see if people do. Well, that's okay. I'll keep moving forward just for sake of time. But really what we found was this modern day homelessness. And so there was multiple like political and social economic changes that can that contributed to the social construction of homelessness. So we had housing and social services. Um, their cuts were increased and the economy was deteriorating. And there was also cuts to federal low income housing programs as well as the deinstitutionalization movement that really started in the 1950s, kind of reached a point where they were no longer the main mode of existence. So mental health systems shifted towards community-based treatment of mental illness, as well as you have um, some of these issues like drugs, the crack epidemic, the war on drugs, um, and you also have this beginnings of what HIV and AIDS has kind of led to now. So those are just to kind of give context to where we are at when this all started. Um, next slide. So before I dive into the history of the Health Commons, I also wanna take a moment to tell you about the meaning this project has brought to my worldview. I'm not officially part of the Saga team, but I've been able to present to the group on the work of the Health Commons. Over the last year, I've been working on the Torsenson book project with President Prebenow and Joel Torsenson and Dow Professor of Sociology, Tim Pippert and Green Bozard. So this has allowed me to think about the history of Augsburg that has bounded us to become mission driven and also our commitment to experiential learning and being responsible, thoughtful neighbors within our community. This has allowed me to also interrogate the history of the Health Commons work itself. During this process, I, I reflected on the purpose of such a journey. And in a previous session, Katie Bishop quoted our digital archivist and associate director of the Lindale Library, Stephen Van Cleve, um, really about saying that interrogation of history is an act of love. This really resonated with me, um, but I really thought more of this interrogation of our history has to frame how we think about ourselves and new possibilities that can be imagined for our future and the power that holds. So these stories have 
um, created a shared sense of identity as we imagine the future, which President Prebenow talked a lot about in the first session, but they remain a vital to our or origin story. And so as the health commons has changed over time to incorporate new questions and issues, we've had to reimagine ourselves and where we're going. So this really makes me have to think about my own positionality in this work, such as my assigned roles, my privilege, privileges and self-interest that may impact my ability to interpret the stories that I've heard over time. Um, and with this, I've had to reflect on my own chosen prof profession, the origin story of nursing, which is really Florence Nightingale. While her and Lillian Wald really are remain the heroes of the profession in my mind, I have to think about the nursing origin stories to the stories that have not been told. So while we're thinking about that, we have to think about those indigenous Lakota people who were criminalized for using healing herbs as native children were forced into unhealthy residential schools and encouraged to assimilate to a biomedical model of treatment. We have to think about black persons who were experienced slavery and cared for the sick, grew herbs, attended birth, and, and acted as wet nurses. But then when the profession became the focus of proper school, proper characteristics, and the use of the application of the knowledge instilled from the biomedical model, their wisdom and experiences were left out. And now as nurses, leaving, we're leaving the profession in droves between the pandemic, um, all the other things that are going on. We wonder why 81% of nurses identify as white and even less are persons of color in higher ed. So these are some of the stories I'm trying to learn and reincorporate in the stories I will tell in the future. So back to the PowerPoint, I just wanted to make that kind of connection to why I'm here. But this picture is from Augsburg's yearbook in 1992. So it marked the beginning of the launch of the experiential learning program um, from Torgensen. And to this, it tied so many things together. Torgensen did endless things that have connected to our commitments and our, our current work. And for example, um, in a class that Muno was in, we were able to go to Stillwater Prison before the pandemic and really analyze the gap between the rich and the poor and how those are really contributing to further inequities and making all of us sicker. And so thinking about back in the 1960s, there was really a co-learning model of education that was taught also at Stillwater Prison. So I've just really learned about all these deep commitments and how we've um, done community engagement in such a unique way. Next slide, slide please. So this is also a picture in the yearbook. Um, also thanks to Stuart Van Cleve for um, finding these. So as you can see, this newspaper clip really is about uh, when Augsburg won the Governor's Youth Service Award for Education for Service. And then lastly, for the digital archives, can you, yep, there you go. All these stories and threads allowed for the chair of the nursing department at that time, Bev Nielsen, to follow her dream and respond on a human scale to the suffering that people were witnessing and experiencing. She was able to take risk in beginning another chapter of Augsburg's story of not only demonstrating educational innovation, but showing up for our neighbors in meaningful ways. As you can see, um, here, these are two uh, newspaper clippings and one is actually from the Star Tribune. Next slide. So this is a picture of our current Augsburg Central Health Commons located at Central Lutheran Church, which is our partner for this location. It, has, uh, it was taken during the pandemic and also during a vaccine event where we partnered with Hennepin County to provide vaccines in, to marginalized communities. Because of our longstanding relationships with the community, we felt we had to partner with others to bring vaccines to people who felt called to have one. Um, so we, we drove to nearby encampments, we brought people interested to the location, um, and we went on to have nine other different events around vaccines with different partners. So uh, when we first started this Health Commons, the fa fa faculty thought it would be a great opportunity for students to engage in service learning. They would be able to host health fairs, they would be able to do research, volunteer their time, but soon it became clear it was much more than that. As you can see on the right-hand side here of this slide, Dr. Ruth Ennestead, who was the coordinator of the Health Commons for well over a decade, she uh, stated here, that nurses need to learn to decode structures of oppression that exclude individuals from discovering means of health. Hmm. Next slide. 
So we're going to discuss the model of nursing practice. Um, the model of nursing practice is really what um, guides our decision at the Health Commons. Uh, this was created by the faculty of the doctoral nursing practice. Uh, practice cohorts of 2009 who had engaged at the Health Commons over the years. Um, and it was inspired by such nursing theorists such as Madeline um, Aleininger, Jean Watson, and Peggy Chin. Um, so there's four stages of the model of nursing practice, uh, stage one being acknowledging the need, so honoring the human story. Um, and this is a picture of a will. Um, stage two being attending to the struggle, um, accompanying the human journey. Stage three, um, affirming strength, so listening and witness. And then stage four is accompanying. Um, there's mutuality of relationship, and it really highlights that. Next slide, please. So um, hospitality, um, really, nurses should not just tolerate differences, but welcome and promote diversity. Uh, Dr. Prebinor really um, often refers to hospitality in his reflections and how it calls us to challenge unfair and unjust uh, systems and practices. Hospitality is the foundation of nursing practice um, at the Health Commons. It's often It often requires nurses to rethink how we engage as we work to create a free open space and um, that fosters belonging and without conditions. So students are um, encouraged um, to connect on a human scale uh, without an intended ag agenda, without um, pushing any viewpoints, without of us, with a bias is spending their judgment. Um, and students are really encouraged to find common ground with the guest um, as a shared humanity where we realize the interconnections of all of us. Uh, next slide, please. So acknowledging the need, um, the role is compassionate caregiver. Um, compassion is truly um, the focus of nursing. Um, as students enter the first stage of the practice um, practice of care, they begin to acknowledge the need of those, those who visit our space. Um, and when guests come in, they, they're not required to show proof um, of need or identification. Um, it's really, uh, you know, that, sh that biomedical structure isn't there. It's a very much a walk-in, welcoming environment. Students are um, encouraged to respond in real-time needs. Um, and instead of structures of assessment or viewing um, visitors um, from a deficit model. Um, we also recognize the agency involved in asking for help and how actually brave it is for individuals to come in and ask for, for help. Um, this takes a lot of courage, um, as well as students often become not only aware of the magnitude of uh, need, but begin to connect um, to common humanity as they are in the role of compassionate caregiving. Um, so also we explore social injustices and responses to observation and often are engaged in a more of a self-awareness process um, as we like reflect and think about the biases that we hold. And one of the other um, realizations that students come to is the importance of moving beyond care um, that is service-based and um, the commodification of care and really understanding that you, um, uh, they're coming in receiving services, but we're also gaining this level of, um, uh, it's a very, it's much of, it's very mutual, it's a mutual relationship, this help. It's not a uh, one-sided relationship. Uh, next slide, please. In the uh, second phase. I would just want to ask you, can any student participate in the health commons or is it only nor nursing students that can participate? It can be any student. So it used to be when we first opened um, that it was only nursing students, but since then we've expanded to include all students. And uh, we got one other real question while we're uh, interrupting you. Um, is this similar to the Phillips Neighborhood Clinic at St. Paul's South Minneapolis operated by the U of M Med School? Oh, who clinic? Uh, yeah. Clinic is actually a federally funded community center, so they're the same as People Center. They're funded from the government through those funds, so they're technically a clinic. We are intentionally are not a clinic, so we don't prescribe or assess. We're trying to kind of break down barriers and meet people where they're at and help them connect where they need to go. Yeah. Thanks. Great, great questions. 
Um, in the second uh, phase is attending to the struggle uh, where nurses attend um, to those um, patients, to those visitors who are under-resourced. Um, people may come and request, um, you know, something as a blood pressure check or um, an item such as a cough drop. Um, and sometimes people just want someone to listen to them. Um, the setting itself is a very non-medicalized environment um, where people, individuals are comfortable um, and there isn't a time constraint. Um, so when you think of a health comments, it's, you know, it's not your rushed appointment where you, you know, if you're five minutes late you're, or you're 10 minutes late, you're can't, you know, your appointment is canceled. It's very much coming in, um, walking in um, and need-based. Um, so students are encouraged to, um, you know, take off that expert hat and just have a conversation um, and connect on a human level um, and participate sometimes even without intervention, without having across as that uh, savior complex where you have to fix or put a band-aid on everything um, and suspending judgment is going to be is extremely important in the setting um, as well as represents um, the health commons represents an opportunity to learn of someone's really complex circumstances um, you know we often we um, students come in having an idea of what drove what made someone become homeless and then they realize that there's so many other factors and there's so many other levels of trauma, generational traumas that exist that led this, um, you know, the uh, uh, homeless population to be so high within the Cedar Riverside community. Um, so, and then they start, students start to reflect on structural violence as they authentically listen to visitors. Mm. And slide, please. Um, so I do want to share that this, this slide that we're talking about at, attending to the struggle um, is uh, Dr. Katie Clark uh, um, in the, sitting down, having a conversation with one of the visitors at the Health Commons. Mm -hmm. next, next slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, with the third uh, stage is uh, affirming strength. So the role is supporter of agency. In this third stage, um, we affirm strength and students are in the role of supporters of agency. Um, so understanding that people have their own control and naming their own desired health outcomes and naming what they want to do about the situation. Um, in nursing um, and in you know healthcare profession itself, we believe that health is, um, it's not just the absence of disease, but the individual gets to define what health means to them. So therefore, it's really important that they are the drivers of their health outcomes and they are very much in control of, you know, any intervention that's uh, being facilitated. Um, so students are asked to name the strength in the stories that they're hearing um, and affirming and building common ground with visitors. Uh, and in this process, the student begins to see creative maneuvers in negotiating, um, you know, margins to problem solve. And sometimes there isn't a problem that they need to solve. Sometimes it's just compassionate connections, compassionate listening, um, and humanly connections. Again, um, sometimes it's just being um, in community with individuals. Um, and this stage is really important because it creates a more just and equitable society um, and it doesn't view other individuals from a um, deficit standpoint. So students are really um, focusing on what their position is in social structures, especially in the healthcare setting. Uh, next slide, please. And then the final stage, um, we have accompanying um, accompaniment. So the role is honoring wisdom. Uh, this final stage is uh, uh, really focuses on de-emphasizing the expert model. Um, this is beyond the role of advocacy. It is walking with the person in a particular time, in a particular uh, place, taking shared risk in society. It is attempting to remove the shackles constraining the origins of knowledge. They are dismantled. As the, as the voices of those who are under-resourced um, become the experts of their own lives. Um, so it's shared knowledge. It's understanding that there are different ways of knowing. It is a journey, epistemological humility, um, as it is a shared journey with one another where power is really leveled um, and expertise is de-emphasized. Often when you think of, um, you know, the, the biomedical structure of um, when they say, you'll, you'll, sometimes you'll hear integrative health. When you think of integrative health, um, 
the way at least I've always been educated is that we're integrating individuals, uh, let's say spirituality. Um, but I feel like the biomedical structure actually has it um, backwards. For example, if an individual from the, uh, let's say a Somali um, man who is experiencing mental health conditions, um, he's been praying five times a day all of his life, his entire adulthood life. And then now he comes in with a mental health condition now we're trying to incorporate medications to help with this mental health condition. What the biomedical structure will actually make it seem that like we're incorporating spirituality, we're integrating his prayer beliefs, but really we're not integrating his spirituality, we're integrating the medicine. So we often have to think about what we're integrating. Um, and so that's why it's so important to um, de-emphasize the expert model. Um, and if we want patients to have positive outcomes, if we want patients to have the outcomes that, you know, are going to um, give them that health advantage, we really need to um, work around um, and accommodate their needs. Mm. Um, so a picture of, um, in this slide, there's a picture of a gentleman who's sitting on the street um, and it looks, you know, as though uh, we need to help him and possibly, you know, he may be, um, you know, not looking for help, or maybe he, you know, may need help that isn't what exactly what we have. So it's really thinking of ways of, you know, this person, you know, like when we think of the homeless population, we only think of, okay, maybe they just need a house, maybe they just need a roof over their head. But oftentimes, um, these interventions, it's beyond just giving someone shelter. Mm. Um, and then the next slide, please. And actually, I'm gonna, can you go back to that slide for her just one second? I just wanna say one quick thing that kind of came up since we created this was that a lot of our um, inspiration around accompaniment has come from Dr. Paul Farmer, who recently just passed away mm -hmm. for a few days. Um, and so really thinking about that shared journey is really breaking away from what is not true in medicine, which, um, Dr. Kwame Ross talked about in his speech a few days, a few sessions ago. But so really trying to think, you know, in this gentleman in particular, he has schizophrenia, he lives on the street, and sometimes nursing means sitting with him until he feels okay for uh, on his own. And so what does that mean and how do we do things differently? So great. So um, next slide, please, CJ. So the at the just at Central, we've had um, 73,000 estimated visitors. Next slide. And then we've had over 1,500 non-repeat students. And then next slide. And this is just a reflection um, from one student who spent, an undergrad student who was a major in biology and now is in dentistry school. But he shared some of his re um, reflections about being involved at the health commons that I thought were pretty powerful. And I won't go through all of them for sake of time, but just a couple. Everyone at the health commons works out of mutual benefit. There's no room for savior complexes. We are all constantly learning and growing from each other, regardless of social economic status or who's providing or receiving services. No condescending attitudes are prosperous in this space. Making assumptions is dangerous. For example, I heard the story of a woman on a subway who was being sexually harassed. A bystander asked a woman why she didn't leave this man and stop the domestic abuse. She responded, it's better to be raped by one man than 12. Never judge a person's situation or assume to know the dynamic behind their decision making. And just one more. I learned to use the term mental injury rather than mental illness, because an injury is a scar that someone is can, can heal from and does not define their perpetual state like an illness diagnosis. Next slide, please. So here you can see a, a picture of some of the happenings at the Health Commons in Cedar Riverside. And so this one came about, um, there was a participatory action research study done with elderly Somali women living in the high rises. And many of the women reported having a declining health uh, the longer they resided in the US. So there was many things that came from the study, but 
a lot of the barriers were really around these discordant health beliefs. So you go to the doctor, they don't ask you about the Quran, like Muna was talking about. Why are we not incorporating religious preference and practices? A sense of time, I'm five minutes late, you cancel me, but I can wait a half an hour for the doctor and gender preferences when it comes to who's providing care to you. The other ones were divergent health expectations. So at home in Somalia, many people were having illnesses around malaria or TB, which could be easily treated with an antibiotic. But here, when you go to the physician, they tell you you're pre-diabetic or you're hypertension hypertensive, but you feel just fine, but they give you a medicine that you're supposed to take and you really don't understand the whole situation when you feel fine. And so we've had so many people come in really around the straight confusion over medications or having, for example, three different providers and three different pharmacies all providing um, hypertensive medication. And then that person either doesn't take them or they're taking all three and they're passing out. So, and I could tell you so many stories, but over time too, uh, I've learned a lot about confusion around insurance and really how that can impact people, not only for the sense of not having insurance, but putting them in debt. And I'm talking extensive debt. So anyhow, from that research, one of the researchers, Sarah Noor, was working at Fairview at that time. So she asked if we could have coffee and maybe we could open another site that would um, be in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. So you can see in this picture here, there's um, some of our guests and um, some of our organizers working in our community garden. There's our youth program, which um, has been part of the girls program. And then there's also a picture of uh, one of our sewing classes we used to have, which was in the women's side of the mosque when we first opened. Next slide. So here before COVID, the programming at the Health Commons really included more, being more of a community gathering space. So at the end of that survey to the uh, research, the women said they wanted a place to go in the neighborhood free of charge without time constraints that they could access healthcare providers. And so really that's what we've tried to gear everything around. When we first opened, we just sat in the space and waited for people to come to us and tell us what they needed instead of coming in with a community health needs assessment and really coming in with more focusing on the deficit model instead of what the strengths were. And so we really waited and it took a long time. And it also took a long time for me being an academic in a setting where there had been a lot of research and people felt like they got their stipend, they told their traumas, and then nothing happened. And so was I getting paid to be there? And what was I gonna do with the stories they told me was a big thing. Um, so over time we've had, um, yeah, more community gathering activities, gardening, swimming, uh, prenatal yoga classes, just regular yoga classes. We've had the, the girls program, which is a place for women to play, or girls to play basketball. So we've kind of had endless programming and we've partnered with others on campus, such as Campus Kitchen, to really respond to the food needs in the food desert, which I can also go on with for a long time, but we'll we'll pause. But so we first uh, were in uh, the women's side of a mosque. And then later we moved into this picture here, you can see into the Riverside Plaza building. We were first just in one space. And then during the pandemic, we actually now are in two separate spaces. Um, so, and you can see some more pictures of here, of people engaging in the different programs at the Health Commons. So since we've opened that location, we've had up close to 35,000 nurse visit encounters. And that doesn't include the youth programs. Next really, slide. Really impressive. Yeah. Um, so, and then um, the encampments. So this is really where I think a lot about, you know, David T.D. was talking a lot about the radical view of the Lutheran Free Church. And it really reminded me, and Elaine Eschenbacher and I were kind of talking about this, really about how Augsburg is rooted in, in faith but breaks away from conventional practice sometimes when it comes to that. And this reminds me of that. So here we are in the pandemic, 
things are closing down and we've partnered with Central Lutheran in such a way that I, I still am so impressed by. Um, Cedar Riverside, we needed to close. And in that setting too, people aren't relying on us for meals, but at Central people are, uh, we've been there for a long time. And so we figured out how to stay open in a new way. Um, even if that meant we were going outside in raincoats and, or snowsuits or whatever it needed to be, we never stopped having our meal. And then what also we realized is, uh, we had, we're partnering with others in, in the county as well as mutual aid groups and realizing people didn't have access to food. And they also didn't have access to toileting and they didn't have access to water. So what is our responsibility in a moment like that? Most people closed down. We stayed open. And so we started going to the encampments. We had, I had gone in, to the encampments in previously, but not to this capacity. So really we were trying to think about um, how we could get involved, but also how could we show up? And so we, since the pandemic hit every Monday, I bring food out to wherever the encampments are at that moment and bring food and water. Um, I think this is very interesting too, um, because others have reached out, seeing that Augsburg has done some of this work and which is unique, I feel like. And so before the pandemic, when Wilder Research was doing their counts on homelessness, I was part of the uh, community outreach group through Heading Home Hennepin and was asked to do some of the counting of those who were homeless when it was a wall of forgotten natives right by Augsburg when it was kind of like that first encampment in like 2018. So I think Muno is one of those students again. Um, but we, like 36 of us went and we spent the entire day and we learned a lot about research and what works and what doesn't. My husband was gonna kill me. I was about seven months pregnant, but we did it and learned a lot. And so also it really speaks to Augsburg and the Augsburg that we are now and where I hope we continue to go in the future. Mm -hmm. I wanna do a, a little deeper dive with you, Katie. And, um, you know, we talked about accompaniment agency, making sure they were in charge um and advocacy and all that requires suspending judgment it requires mm -hmm. being so open-ended could you give me another example or uh, how can we help people better understand what what that takes just from an attitude of, of what we would call generosity or a sense of grace that we're accepting people just as they are in their predicament without pre-judging and whatnot. How, what, what's involved with you uh, as you do that? Help us understand the, what that's about. Sure, I guess I have endless things that come to mind, but one of maybe the simpler things that comes to mind for me was when I was working in the medical ICU or intensive care unit, I had end-stage liver patients all the time. And everyone would be like, here's another guy who drank himself to death and we're just gonna abuse the system and then the girlfriend's gonna come in and she's gonna reek of cigarettes and have an attitude. Like that was just kind of where people's heads were at. Well, now being with people on this journey, I realized so much what of what happens to people. Uh, so you grow up, you never had unconditional love, right? This is a true story of one gentleman. He, his parents were using drugs, he went into foster care, never had a sense of belonging, started drinking as a kid, aged out of foster care. Well, now you better, you know, buck up and be a man and get a job and ID and take care of yourself. When he really never was able to develop in a healthy way, and that trauma really rewires your brain. And so we're not taking those things into consideration when we're judging the the drunk on the corner who can't stop drinking. We don't understand the trauma that's been held on in that moment, or maybe the generations before him that have played into this situation. So really trying to understand that there's always more to the story. And maybe somebody's not gonna tell me their whole story, but that they don't have to. Like, that's a privilege when people want to share some of that. But I think sometimes we really look at things at face value or try to decide what happens and don't understand the whole story behind that person. And it's not always easy to do. I mean, there's times where, I, you know, you get frustrated or you know that somebody is, you know, maybe 
they've been involved with things that you really wish you didn't know that they had been involved with. Those are some of the harder ones, but there's always situations that rise. Um, there was a woman who kept urinating in her diaper and it was like, why are you doing this? Well, it's so men leave her alone. She smells like urine. So she knows that no one is going to hurt her when she's in the shelter overnight. So for her, that's a survival method. So I could go on and on, but did that at least answer somewhat? Yeah, you're giving us a, a upfront and real close understanding of what it takes. And, um, and we find ourselves judging our family, let alone people that we don't know. And you're an inspiration to us as we try to hold judgment and allow people have space to have their own issues in life and take them as they are, not as we wish them to be or how we mm -hmm. want them to change. Um, yeah, and I think for me, I have the least compassion for, which I need to work on, is people with other political views of mine. So, you know, that's a place where I really need to have compassion and focus more on nonviolence and thinking about the institution or the systems that have created that person's way of thinking that is different than mine and not mm -hmm. focus on the human, but more the um, having a still healthy relationship despite those differences. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't want to totally interrupt if there's other, uh, let you continue with whatever here. That actually uh, leads a, a great job leading to our next slide, um, that question that you asked. So, And um, the next slide is a quote. Um, and so in our minds, uh, we need to continue to uh, be the Augsburg of now as we continue to lead a path uh, forward, grounded in the practice the practice of radical hospitality. I think that's the answer um, to really the question, is ra practicing radical hospitality, really trying to figure out how we can best be neighborly, um, how we can um, be of and in community. Um, this type of welcoming our neighbors really demands a lot of humility, a lot of suspending judgment, um, where the wisdom and strengths of those who um, we may seek to understand are uplifted and where relationships are not only on trust but on mutual benefit. Um, this also reminds us of the teaching by the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he urged us all to love one another unconditionally and despite differences, which he believed was at the core of living a nonviolence way of life, it is love and power that builds community. It is unconditional and doing with the community instead of doing for it as methods of connecting are grounded in belief that medicine must be humanized, that to be healthy means really to be in community. Uh, so co-creation leads the next steps, which must be fostered as a collective. It builds on our uh, interconnectedness. It's a teaching that comes from the Aboriginal uh, people as if, which um, there's a quote, uh, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up to mine, then let us walk and work together. Uh, lastly, we want um, to really reflect on a quote by uh, Kazu Haga, um, which, uh, who was a nonviolence educator and author, as uh, this really uplifted us. Um, it's a moment we need to pay attention um, to as we are part of a community that has really endured so much the last few years. Um, and this quote is, we are harmed in relationships, so we need to heal in relationships. We are harmed in community, so we need to heal in community. And um, often, you know, this homeless, uh, this issue, the social problem of homelessness, um, we continue to think in our head that, you know, at least for my um, my perspective, prior to taking Katie's classes, it was, oh, we just need to build more shelters. We just need to build more homes. We just need to have more affordable um, houses. But it's really not just about housing. Housing is one part of the issue. We really need to figure out ways to trans help transform um, traumas so that they're not transferring onto next generations. Um, we need more 
mental health resources. Um, we need, you know, early development, childhood uh, resources. We need so much more beyond just building, making, um, creating more uh, shelters and creating more affordable homes. Um, if you think of um, individuals who are struggling with polysubstance um, abuse, who are, you know, struggling with, um, uh, you know, un being uh, that are under resourced in terms of. Um, uh, coping mechanism and lack healthy coping mechanisms, they will go back to all those situations that originally made them homeless. So we really need early interventions. We need, um, you know, we need more than just um, more housing. Um, so we're going to end our presentation with hearing from the voices of the past as we listen to Pastor Bill Youngdell and Dr. Joel Torsenson. Torsenson in the late 1970s on the Augsburg, um, on Augsburg, as they unknowingly speak of Augsburg of today, as we conclude this example of Augsburg's faith in action. So, next slide, please. Very briefly then in conclusion, the college really is a supporter or should be a supporter of social revolution. It is my conviction that every institution of the city must be opened up so that the power which is held only by one part of the city might be equitably distributed among all the residents. We are called not to be defenders of the status quo, but to be prophets of a new order in which human values have priority over property values. The primary hunger in our city is not for law and order, but for justice. Regardless of where others choose to walk, we here at Augsburg must take our direction from Robert Frost. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Oh. The sense of linkages between the past and the present and with a, with a deep commitment to the future. It seems to me this is one of the most uh, urgent needs of our time is that uh, instead of lamenting the perils of, of our time, um, somehow with a sense of optimism that is not naive, uh, face the future. The sense of linkages between the past and the present and with a with a deep commitment to the future it seems to me this is one of the most uh, urgent needs of our time is that uh, instead of lamenting the perils of, of our time um, somehow with a sense of optimism that is not naive uh, face the future No, that's okay. It didn't go all the way, but we can always send it out to people too, because I know we're over our time as well. Sorry about that. So yeah, does anybody have any questions for us at all? I think I saw President Prevenal write something in the chat about street voices of change. Yeah, so I can just explain real quick about we've we've partnered a lot with this group um, that's been around for about five years now. It's called Street Voices of Change. So it's people who have experienced homelessness or are currently homeless, um, and they uh, meet 
once a month or once a week at Central on Thursday mornings, and they talk about issues they care about that they want to take action on. So no outsider like myself, I'm an outsider, I've never lived on the streets, is invited. And so they really try to organize around things like um, things that are happening in the shelter that they really feel like there's human rights abuses. But they also try to organize with um, thinking too about can we evaluate the health commons? Um, what's happening on the street? And so I have, during the pandemic, I was able to go and we'd all go together out to the encampments and do different things as well as we did an oral history project with them. And so if you go to the digital archive, there's, I think I don't, I don't even know how many oral histories now I've done, but I've lost track. But for sure I have, I think five from people who are experiencing homelessness from street places of change and they wanna do more because they wanna collect their stories of what has happened during the, the uh, social un the unrest. Uh, George Floyd was a person that had visited some of the services at Central. Um, and so he was part of that collective community, as well as um, do they someday down the road wanna write a book or do something with their stories to really speak to people who are trying to make different changes in policies to think about these are the real life experiences people have gone through. So they actually really are working at the State Department right now to push through some legislation. So this is kind of a new thing, but they're, they've really been a great group to partner with and ask questions to. So. Thank you, Katie. Um, I think Jack maybe is having trouble. He looks like he's not on right now, so maybe I'll just uh, uh, step in and um, see if there are other questions that folks had. If you want to just uh, unmute or put it in the chat, whatever is easiest for you. I think you can see based on this presentation why I saved this one for last. <laughs> So, um, you know, when you think about what we've talked about before, going way back to our commitment to place and then to you know, really the ways in which Augsburg has stepped up on a whole variety of fronts to be uh, the first to do things, you know, here you have now uh, an example of what that looks like in action. And I, um, I have the privilege of working closely with Katie um, as she reports to me and her role as the executive director of the Health Commons. And so, um, you know, this model is just um, so compelling. So. Um, so Jack, I see you're back. Um, you want to pick it up? Jack, you're on mute. I want to thank both Muna and Katie again for uh, the presentation uh, today. And um, I, I just want to ask one more kind of quick question, and that is, this has really grown exponentially, and I'm just wondering, is there ways in which the Augsburg faculty and other members, how do they become involved in this? Um, what are some other entry points for the Augsburg community to not only be of the community, in the community, but now with the community? Yeah, so actually a lot of our volunteers have been um, alumni or also we have uh, constantly trying to reimagine what we are and where we're gonna go. And so a lot of work with the um, physician assistant program has happened over the last year where we're intentionally thinking about, you know, could we have a, a more formal partnership, especially in the Cedar Riverside location. For right now, when you're in healthcare um, arenas, social determinants of health and health inequity are the thing that people are really trying to figure out what to do about. And I would say that we are leaps and bounds ahead of other universities in how we do this. But the big problem for other universities is they have to do research. And with this work, there really isn't a lot of opportunity to do research because people really feel like their voices are um, minimized and um, not truly heard in those processes. And it, it does become about the role of the expert really then, especially when you're funded by grants. So I really feel like Augsburg um, lives out their mission in this work, but also is allowing for healthcare providers to think about these issues in new ways. Well, well thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that response. Um, we do wanna talk about how all of this now fits together, uh, these four sessions. And uh, so again, um, Paul, I'd like to bring you back in 
to talk about that. I mean, you uh, opened this up uh, four weeks ago, um, and I think uh, some of those early statements that you made um, about why we're doing this and what's involved with this, um, I would like us to, to move towards putting closure on it by tying it together. Well, thanks, Jack. Um, one thing I would just uh, note for folks, uh, people who know me know that my office at Augsburg is located in the Memorial Hall, the old residence hall, and met maybe some folks on here who actually lived in that hall. And my office is the old lounge on the end of that uh, first floor, where I always tell people that's where uh, people gathered to solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> you know, and so I feel particularly gifted to be in that space. But one of the gifts for me was that when I first came to Augsburg in that office, the office next door was the nursing office. Um, and so I got to know our nursing faculty very well starting in 2006 and uh, from right from the beginning of uh, certainly the health commons is the most wonderful kind of manifestation of that but you have an entire department that is really focused on exactly what katie i think has pointed to which is this uh, really uh, working hard to overcome the kind of dominant model that uh, that really does uh, create this gap between experts and those who um, are in need and i just feel like um, you know, that's a fight worth fighting, um, and it takes lots of different forms, but I think you've heard here from Katie and Muna just the ways in which it has really informed the work we do. Um, so I'd go back to um, just reminding folks, uh, many of you I know have been on all four of these sessions, but um, when I talked in that first session about why we were uh, interrogating our his historical heritage or our um, saga, as I called it then, um, it had really three component parts, and I think in many ways, you know, Katie, just in her introduction, did a wonderful job of illustrating um, kind of a case study of what that looks like. So, so she went back to Joel Torstensen and in the Saga group and in our Torstensen project, we have in fact done a deep dive into what Joel meant to Augsburg starting in uh, the, certainly whatever he joined the faculty, but also especially starting in the mid sixties. And so we've been educating ourselves. We brought this kind of appreciative inquiry going back to individuals and movements and, and projects that perhaps we didn't even know about um, and trying to understand what actually happened in that moment and why it was important in that moment. Um, but then at the same time, you know, uh, that educating ourselves, that appreciative inquiry sometimes leads to needing to also, um, if you will, I'll use a kind of jargony word, but problematize, actually think about um, both what it reflects back to us and what Katie talks about, um, you know, her own experience from where she's perched now, looking back at that and trying to uh, undo some of the uh, stereotypes that we have uh, or, or deal with some of the ways that uh, in that moment, you know, what Joel was doing and the creation of things like the crisis colony and some of the things he started, you know, maybe we don't like the language that they used, or maybe we aren't exactly comfortable with exactly how they set out to do it, but to try to understand what was going on in that moment and what was, you know, what was behind the kind of movement. And in some cases to take responsibility for the fact that perhaps we didn't live up to our highest aspirations, either as individuals or as, as an institution. So there is a, a certain accountability, if you will, a, uh, the need for both stating the truth and maybe reconciling ourselves to uh, where we didn't live up to those aspirations. But the ultimate goal of this project, of course, is then to, to set a path forward and to think about taking seriously all these threads of our history. And as, as you've heard in these sessions, we go all the way back to you know Hans Nielsen Hauge. I mean, for heaven's sake, we're going back a couple hundred years. And, and what we're trying to do here is to try to understand um, what those threads lead us to in terms of a path forward for our institution and for us individually within that institution. And so when uh, Katie talks about how this work and Luna talks about how this work is uh, going to continue to expand and, and the ways in which even the health commons as an idea has taken root in lots of different places, um, you know, that's in some ways uh, what we're hoping this saga work will lead us to is a sense of what what informs us, what what motivates us, what's it, what inspires us, what challenges us to, in fact, do this work going forward. So, so education, accountability, and setting a path forward were the three purposes of this project. And uh, I hope in these four weeks you've got, I appreciate we haven't been able to, you know, delve into every aspect, but gotten sort of a glimpse of some of the work that we've been doing and some of the really fascinating things that we've been able to learn about Augsburg and about ourselves. so. Well, thank you, Paul. And I think um, it's it's time now, as we've been inspired by the work that, that Augsburg's doing and your group and the Lilly Grant that have provided for all of this, the, the question now, as we look to next year and we're looking at Center Life Series, we wanna 
explore then how do we look at our own historical past as individuals, as many of us are in that second half and third chapter of our lives, how does our own lives get reflected through our own histories? And what is it that is new for us as we move to the future um, as individuals and as the institutions in which we find ourselves serving beyond Augsburg? And so next year, we want to return back <laughs> to ourselves in this group and, and use this year's inspiration to talk about our own need to find a historical future, a future built on who we have, have been and who have we become as we also seek our individual futures. So that's going to be the challenge for next year in light of the, hopefully this has been both inspirational, uh, but even more importantly, um, it has been a, a, an opportunity for you to also step into an institution that has taken seriously its history, its tradition, um, and trying to forge a future based on the, the rootedness of, of, who, of, of who we've become. And so the future rests, I think, again, with us taking heart and doing our own work around our own sense of calling, both as individuals, as families, and, uh, and addressing the institutions in which we want to continue to serve. So thank you all. Uh, for this series, and we look forward to the fall, uh, and we will explain it in more detail in the coming days as we prepare for the fall presentations for Centered Life series. So with that, we, we say adieu until we meet again. So take care, one and all. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Muna.